Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus, walking in the Spirit, and experiencing the full joy of your salvation. Well, we're going to continue in our study in Love Not the World, a book that we've been going through for some time now. And today we're going to be, I believe, in chapter 9, which is entitled, My Laws in Their Hearts. Now, before we begin today, I just want to continue to encourage you, and it's been some time since I've actually reminded you of the importance of reading God's Word every day. But friends, you're not going to grow the way that you're supposed to grow in the Spirit unless you are feeding yourself the Word of God each and every day. Now, this can come from your own private reading and Bible study, and this can also come from listening to men like John MacArthur teach the Bible in ways that we're not going to understand it ourselves. But whatever your choice, however you choose to study the Bible and get the Word of God into you, it is my prayer that you will begin to experience the great joy that comes from being in the Word of God every day because you cannot begin to explain it and you cannot begin to understand it until you experience it for yourself. So again, spend time in the Word of God each and every day and allow the Spirit to become one with your spirit so that you begin to change into a better follower of our glorious God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that you can be a faithful ambassador unto him while you are here on this earth. I love you, friends, and that's my hope and prayer, is that you are truly growing in the Spirit of God each and every day, and you are experiencing the full joy of your salvation and what it means to be a privileged follower of King Jesus of Nazareth. Well, with that being said, again, we're going to continue our study in the book, Love Not the World, and we're going to start today in chapter 9. Uh, which is titled, My Laws in Their Hearts. In earlier chapters, we have been building up a picture of this world, not just as a location, nor as a race of people, nor indeed as anything merely material, but rather as a spiritual system at the head of which is God's enemy. The world is Satan's masterpiece, and we have thought of him as directing all his strength and ingenuity into causing it to flourish. But to what end? Surely to capture men's allegiance and draw them unto himself. Satan has one objective, to establish his own dominion in human hearts worldwide. Even though he must be aware that the dominion may last only briefly, that, without question, is his goal. And as the end of the age approaches and his efforts increase, so does the distress of God's people intensify. For as aliens and sojourners, our position as the people of God in this world in which we live, yet not being of this world, it is an uncomfortable one. You see, we would fain seek relief from the spiritual tension in physical distance. How good it would be to escape from this world completely and be forever with the Lord. But clearly, that is not his will. As we saw, Jesus prayed the Father not to take us out of this world, but to preserve us from the evil one. We read this in John chapter 17. Now, Paul takes a similar line, having in a particular instance exhorted the Corinthian believers not to have fellowship with a certain class of sinner, he immediately takes steps to guard against possible misunderstanding. They are not to isolate themselves. They are not to sever connections with all sinners in the world, nor even with those in the category described for to do so would involve their leaving the world altogether. I wrote unto you in my epistle 
to have no company with fornicators, not altogether or not at all meaning with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous and extortioners or with idolaters. For then you would have to leave this world. This is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. It is clear from Paul's words, therefore, that we may and indeed must associate with the world to a certain extent. For is it not the world that God so loved? But here is the question, friend. To what extent? How far may we go? All of us agree that we are obliged at some points to touch the things of the world. But presumably, there is a limit somewhere. Keep within that limit, and we are safe. Exceed it, and we risk becoming implicated by Satan. I do not think we can exaggerate this problem. For it is an acute one, and the dangers are real. If the time should come when you are actually ill and in great pain, and the doctor should prescribe for you heroin or morphine, you would instantly be alive to the danger of developing a craving for that particular drug. You would obey the doctor and take the treatment, but you would take it fearfully and prayerfully, for you know there is a power in that medicine, and you know you are liable to come under that power. This would be especially so if the treatment had to be prolonged. Every time you and I touch the world through the things of the world, and we must admit we do so repeatedly, but every time that we touch the things of this world, we should feel much as we would feel about taking morphine or heroin or any other drug. You see, just as we, if seriously ill, are prescribed opium as a treatment, so also, because we are still in the world, we have to do business with the world. We have to follow some trade or employment. We have to earn our livelihood. But how much treatment with dangerous drugs can I safely take without falling a prey to the opium craving? I do not know. And how many things I buy or how much money I make or how close can be my business or professional associations without my becoming hooked, I likewise do not know. All I know is that there is a satanic power behind every worldly thing. How vital, therefore, for every Christian to have a clear revelation of the spirit of the world in order to appreciate how real is the danger to which he is continually exposed. Perhaps you think I'm going too far. Perhaps you say, oh yes, that may be a good sermon illustration, but I find it hard not to feel that you are overstating the case. But when you see, friend, then you will say of the world, as you say of opium, that there is a sinister power behind it, a power designed to seduce and to captivate men. Those whose eyes have been really open to this world's true character find that they must touch everything in it with fear and with trembling, looking continually unto their Lord. They know that at any moment they are liable to be caught in Satan's entanglements, just as the drug which, in the first instance, is welcome to relieve sickness so equally the things of the world which we can legitimately use under the Lord's authority may, if we are heedless, become a cause of our downfall. Only fools can be careless in circumstances like these. No wonder we look with envy upon John the Baptist. How easy we feel, if like him, we could simply withdraw into a safe place apart from this world. But we are not like him. Our Lord has sent us into the world, in his own footsteps, to go unto the people just as he went unto the people. Since God so loved the world, his command to us is to go into all the world and proclaim his good news. 
And surely that all includes the folk with whom we must rub shoulders daily. So a serious problem faces us here. As we have said, presumably, there must be a limit. Presumably, God has drawn somewhere a line of demarcation. Stay within the bounds of that line, and we will be safe. Cross it, and grave danger threatens. But where does it lie? We have to eat and drink. We have to marry and bring up children. We have to trade and to toil. But how do we do so and yet remain uncontaminated by this world? How do we mingle freely with the men and women whom God so loved as to give his son for them and still keep ourselves unspotted from this world? If our Lord had limited our buying and selling to so much a month, how simple that would be. The rules would be plain for any to follow. All who spent more than a certain amount per month would be worldly Christians, and all who spent less than that amount would be unworldly. But since our Lord has stipulated no figure, we are cast on him unceasingly. For what? I think the answer is very wonderful. We are not to be tied by rules, but we are to remain all the time within bounds of another kind, the bounds of his life. If our Lord has given us a set of rules and regulations to observe, then we could take great care to abide by these. In fact, However, our task is something far more simple and straightforward, namely, to abide in the Lord Jesus himself. Then we could keep the law. Now we need only keep in fellowship with him. And the joy of it is that provided we live in close touch with God, his Holy Spirit within our hearts will always tell us when we reach the limit. We spoke earlier of the kingdom of Antichrist, soon to be revealed, John tells us. And in John's epistle, he writes to his little children about the world and the things of the world. You'll read of this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And there he goes on to warn them, As you heard, that Antichrist cometh, even now have there arisen many Antichrists. Faced with these, and with that even more insidious spirit of the Antichrist, where have you have heard that it cometh, and now it is in the world already, what are they to do? How are they, in their simplicity, to know what is true and what is false? How are they possibly to tell which ground is treacherous to walk upon and which is safe? How are we? Well, the answer John gives to them and to us is so simple that today we are afraid to believe it. John tells us that we have an anointing from the Holy One, and we know all things. The anointing which you received of him abides in you, says John, and you need not that anyone teach you. But as his anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is no lie, and even as it taught you, so abide in him. This is found in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 27. Now this is certainly an allusion to the spirit of truth, who Jesus promised to his disciples, to his followers, each and every one of us. And Jesus said in John chapter 16, verses 8 through 13, that it is this spirit that would both convict the world and guide them into all truth. Jesus also said in John chapter 17, thy word is truth. And so if we are to learn of where our limitations and the boundaries exist for us as God's people, we learn of them by reading and studying his holy word. In any given instance, 
there must be safe limits known to God beyond which we should not go. They are not marked out on the ground for us to see, but one thing is certain. He who is the comforter will surely know them, even if perhaps Satan knows them too. Can we not trust the Holy Spirit? If at some point we are about to overstep them, can we not depend on the Holy Spirit at once to make us inwardly aware of the fact? In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul offers us some further guidance on this same topic. When he says in chapter 7, verses 29 to verse 32, This I say, brethren, the time is shortened, that henceforth both those that have wives may be as those that have none, and those that weep as though they wept not, and those that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and those that buy as though they possess not, and those that use the world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passes away, but I would have you to be free from such cares. Now here several matters are in turn touched upon, but the governing factor in them all is clearly this, that the time is shortened, or as some translators render it, the time has been straightened. We are living, the apostle says, in days of peculiar pressure, and the principle that must guide us for such days as this is that they who have be or live as not having. Does Paul, we wonder, contradict himself? Because in Ephesians chapter 5, he enjoins husbands to love their wives with a perfect love, even the love that Christ loves his church no less. Yet here he tells his followers to live as though not having wives at all. Does he honestly, we exclaim in dismay, expect us at one and the same time to reconcile such complete opposites? Here at once it must be said that such a paradoxical life is a life that none but Christians can live. Perhaps the expression as not having affords us a clue. It reveals that the matter is an inner matter, a question of the heart's loyalty. In Christ, there is an inner liberation to God, not merely an outward change of conduct. Let me read that again. In Christ, there is an inner liberation to God, an inner freedom to God, not merely an outward change of conduct. You see, in Ephesians chapter 5, they have, yet they are not bound by what they possess. So that having not, they equally rejoice in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Notwithstanding all they have, they are so truly delivered in spirit from the world's possessiveness that they can live as not having. This is the secret to spiritual freedom, friends. We must understand the natural man lives at one extreme or the other, either having and being wholly taken up with what he has, or if he is religious, putting away what he has so that he no longer has it, and so being no longer concerned with it at all. But the Christian way is utterly different from the natural way. The Christian way to solve the problem is not by removing the thing, but by delivering the heart from the grip of that thing. Let me read that again. The Christian way to solve the problem is not by removing the thing, but by delivering the heart from the grip of that thing. You see, the wife is not removed, nor the affection for the wife. But both wife and husband are freed from the overwhelming dominance of that affection. So too, the trouble that caused weeping is not removed, but the life is no longer controlled by that trouble. The cause of joy still remains, 
but there is an inner check against vain abandon to the thing that caused it. We buy and sell as we always have before, but an inward deliverance has loosened the personal grip upon them. We have them all, but we have them as not having. We talk sometimes about our desire to maintain, like John, the testimony of Jesus in the earth. Let us remember that this testimony is based not on what we can say about this or that, but on what Satan can say about us. God has put us in the world, and often he locates us in some specially difficult places where we are tempted to feel that worldlings have a much easier time than do Christians. That is because Christians are indeed aliens, living here in this world in an element that is not naturally theirs. A swimmer may dive deep into the sea, but without special clothing and an airline to the atmosphere that is his own, he cannot stay there. The pressure is too great and he must breathe the air of the world to which he belongs. He stays deep as long as there is a task to do, and as long as he is supplied with the power to overcome the element around him. But he does not belong to that element, and it has no part in him. Thus it is that the problem of our touch with the world is not solved by any change of outward action. Some think that at a time like this in which we are living, it is a sign of spirituality to make no provision for the coming days. That is not spirituality. It is folly. What we may do with the provision we make is a question we shall consider in our final chapter. But God's word makes it plain that we are to use the world for his glory. We are to eat and drink. We are to trade merchandise and grow crops. We are to rejoice, yes, and if need be, to weep. And yet we are not to use any of these things to the full. We have learned what is at stake in our relationship with this world. It is no wonder, therefore, that we have learned also to tread softly, heedful all the while of the Comforter's gentle constraining. Jesus came from above. He could claim without fear of challenge, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. He said this in John 14, 30. The line of demarcation was drawn, not on the ground at his feet, but in his own heart. But just as truly everything in this world that is from above, is as safe as he is. God is at the head of the airline, working the pumps, as it were. A life that belongs above is being sustained and provided for down here by him. Thus it comes about that if a thing is spiritual and of God, we need not worry about it nor contend for its preservation. Jesus said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world, else my servants would fight for me. But here in this world, they have no need to fight. God does not worry about us simply because he has no anxiety about his Holy Spirit. There is a sense in which poor quality spiritual life is impossible because spiritual life is God's life. And just as truly, spiritual life can only be overwhelmed if God himself can be overwhelmed. Let me repeat this. Please understand this, friend. God does not worry about us simply because he has no anxiety about his Holy Spirit. He trusts that his Holy Spirit is doing a work in us. There is a sense in which poor quality spiritual life is impossible because spiritual life is God's life. And just as truly spiritual life can only be overwhelmed if God himself can be overwhelmed. So as I said in the beginning, 
Walk, begin to walk, learn to walk in the fullness of all of the joy, hallelujah, of your salvation. You have been saved. Your sins have been forgiven and heaven will be your home. Abide in Jesus. Walk in the spirit. Smile at life and tell everyone you know about the same love and joy that they can experience if they will only surrender to the Lord Jesus. Well, back to Watchman Me. God does not argue about this fact. He is content to leave it to the comforter to make it real in us. You see, he told us in 1 John 4, 4, you are of God, my little children, and you have overcome them because greater is he that is in you, hallelujah, than he that is in the world. Again, the very same verse which tells us that the whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. Yes, the very same verse assures us as followers of the Lord Jesus that we are of God. We are of God, hallelujah. Could we possibly discover a more blessed fact to balance against that other ugly fact and to outweigh it? We who believe on Jesus' name were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but we were born of God, praise his name, and praise him because we are begotten of God. The evil one cannot touch us. Read John 1, 13 and 1 John 5, 18. You see, brothers and sisters, put very simply, Satan's power in the world is everywhere. Yet wherever men and women walk in the spirit, sensitive to the anointing they have from God, that power that belongs to Satan simply evaporates. There is a line drawn by God, a boundary whereby virtue of his own very presence, Satan's writ does not run. Let God but occupy all the space himself, friends, and what room is left for the evil one? So let us end by asking ourselves this simple question. Are we thus utterly for God? Can Satan testify of you and me? I cannot entrap that man. I cannot entrap that woman. And that's where the chapter ends, interestingly enough, because it was really starting to get good. <laughs> I was starting to feel this, the preacher within me come out. And yet, for whatever reason, he's decided to end the chapter here. So I too shall end. But friend, let me encourage you to walk in the joy, the full joy of your salvation. Because do you remember in the book of 1 John, he says, I'm writing this letter to you so that you will know joy, the full joy of all that it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus. And so I leave you there today, friend. I pray that till we meet again, you begin to enjoy the full assurance and blessedness of your salvation. And you will not allow the enemy to beat you down by the troubles of this life or even by regrets of your past, but that you will remind both yourself and Satan that you may not be the man or woman that you want to be, but praise God, praise his holy name. You are not the man or woman that you used to be. His spirit has been alive in your life, changing you into a better image of the person of the Lord Jesus. And he's not finished yet, friends. He's going to continue that work in you until the day that his son returns for us. Hallelujah. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful again that you were with us today, that you took some time out of your busy day, and I understand that you're busy, but that you took some time out to get a little bit of the Word of God in you. But let it not end with this video. Spend personal time in the Word of God 
and and listen to people like John MacArthur and Paul Washer and others that are preaching the unadulterated truth of God's word so that you can become the best follower of the Lord Jesus that you can be and you can stand before him one day faithful and true knowing that you've done all in your power to be obedient to his law, his will, his way as you possibly can. Well, until we meet again, friends, I truly love you. May the Lord Jesus bless you, and may you walk fully in his spirit. Now, as he wills, and until next time, I love you. I'll see you on the next video.